Thank you. Thank you, Samaya. Hello, Bushwick. Uh, I'm sorry we're not, Christine, I'm sorry we're not in Bushwick together right now. No, but I need to clarify where I am. Where uh, are you? I'm in a motel in Pennsylvania. Okay. okay. Not my decor. So on my way back to the East Village, hence the plastic cup. <laughs> now, are you in are you in Pennsylvania for work or was it no, personal stuff? Although I will be in Pennsylvania for work very soon because we are going to start shooting Billy Porter's movie in Pittsburgh. Um, but no, I'm just driving back from my uh, partner's parents' house. Oh, An good. unexpected visit, which is why we decided to stop for the night so I could have real Wi-Fi. Okay, well, I'm glad, and we won't judge you on the on the back whatever's behind you there. There's like a, a Instagram account or or something, a social media account that like judges people on their their oh, I'm sure. their, their Zoom I'm sure. their Zoom backgrounds. So hopefully they'll take they'll they'll go easy on both of us for that reason. Um, well, welcome, Christine. Um, uh, I I was just thinking as I was preparing for this afternoon, um, I've had the opportunity, the great fortune, and I've really enjoyed over many years now having the opportunity to sit with you, usually in person, um, and have a conversation at a film festival or at a at a at a fest at an event in New York or at Lincoln Center where I work. Um, I don't know if maybe, maybe we've had one of these once before Zoom on Zoom, but um, we'll uh, we'll making the best of it. You're in Pennsylvania, Absolutely. I'm in New York. Uh, so thank you for doing this and thank you to everybody at the festival and, um, and, and everyone involved in putting this event together uh, for inviting us to do this um, and for inviting me to, to, to moderate. I went back, Christine, and I, I, I know that you have two books, but I went back and read a bit of this one um, because I think, you know, I think frankly, to Samaya's point, um, and I've said this, I'll embarrass myself in front of you. Like I've said this to numerous people and I'm sure you do too, actually, Christine. Um, this, is, this is one of those books that if, if, you're, if you are uh, aspiring to, to have a, you know, a, a fraction of the career that Christine has, has had and we'll talk about today, I just think it's an essential, it's, it's become an essential book. I mean, you must feel that now, the kinds of questions you get and the kind of the feedback you get still about it. You must teach the book still too. I, I do. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, it was written at such a sort of like inflection point because literally a year later, a year after it came out, uh, digital filmmaking blew in and like blew celluloid filmmaking, which is what I really talk about in the book, uh, you know, it, it kicked it to the curb to some degree. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, because I really felt I wanted the book to be, uh, to really be a manual, to really feel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like people could use it uh, to help themselves, you know, figure out how to do it. And then I reread it and I thought, you know, actually it doesn't really matter. You know, even though we were talking about filmmaking, meaning celluloid, it's the premise is always the same. And what kind of, what I kind of love about it now is, you know, I bet if I read a book from the thirties, that was written by a me from the 30s or the 40s, it would kind of be exactly the same because the actual physical like brick and mortar part of film production hasn't really changed. I mean, all the materials, think, materials have changed and, the, and, and all of that, but what you actually have to do hasn't really changed. Well, and that's what we're gonna talk about today because there's a spirit and an ethos that I think comes back, comes across. I'm looking at this book, not as a filmmaker, I'm looking at, at, at this book as a, Kind of foundational work that talks about you know um a spirit and an ethos of independent filmmaking uh, of you at the at, at an earlier stage of your career um but also i think just um a spirit and i use the word spirit intentionally um a spirit that that is sort of infused in in you in your work and the kinds of choices that you made especially early on in your career um and i think that's some you know when i've, I've taught um an independent film course a few times at um, at the new school, and I've always I've always um, encouraged folks to read this book because I think it just gives you not only a window into these these films that that are that are that that you were um, that you made um, just before just before writing it, but also just kind of a, a window into what it means to be an independent producer, whether that's on celluloid, whether that's for right. you know for di for video or for television or for series, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, there's and I think there's a now, when I look back at it, 
I guess I just, I, it gives me a window into you, but it also gives me a window into sort of like the roots, the roots of what we're sort of, what folks are building on top of now, you know? Sure. Um, Christine is, uh, you know, as Samaya said in her intro, I mean, I, I think there's plenty of, there's, there's certainly any number of your peers and colleagues that we can single out as, um, as you know, important to telling the story of independent film and independent film production. Um, but I see, I see Christine, Christine, I see you as singular in that um, some of your peers have gone on to, to run studios or to, to run other um, you know, larger entities, no, no, uh, no shade at, at that at all. But where I'm going with this is you have, um, you have remained independent and we'll talk about what that means. Um, that has to of course come with its freedoms and also with its challenges. Um, but you have also stayed true from what I can tell um, to the spirit and the taste and that ethos that is exhibited in in, in this book and in sort of what you've been doing and talking about in the independent film community for a few decades now. Um, so we'll talk about the challenges and, and, and how you sustain that over a career. Um, because I think this, while you and I've talked in a bunch of different contexts, I think today is, is also about giving some, um, sharing some knowledge with folks who, who again might be uh, you know, looking to to uh, have a taste of, of a kind of career that you have uh, and it can be helpful and useful. Um, somebody, a friend of mine who I, you know, we posted this on social media and I'm getting people or friends of mine who are saying they're gonna watch or some folks I know are saying they're gonna watch. Somebody said we should have had a, a, a wine, we should have had a wine pairing with this core, with this class. Uh, I didn't even think about it. Um, I should have because uh, when, 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 when Christine is flying, jetting around the world, she's also a really great uh, connoisseur of um, airport, uh, lounge wineries, uh, wine, wine choices and, and food choices, snack choices. You must be missing that right about now. Very much. <laughs> um, why don't you, if you don't mind, Christine, uh, as a way to kind of ease into this conversation, if you don't mind, there's, there's a couple things you have out in the world right this minute. So if you don't mind telling us what those are and we'll start with those, uh, we'll start there. Sure. I mean, we have, we have two series that both dropped on the same day, which was, you know, uh, I guess serendipitous. Um, uh, so uh, the first one was Halston, which I'll talk about first because we actually shot it during the pandemic. And, um, and that was an extraordinary challenge. You know, I, I know we're all sick and tired maybe of hearing about like the masks and the PPE and all the testing, et cetera. So I won't go into it unless somebody wants me to. Um, but I will say that, you know, one of the things it did was sort of that kind of disruption forces you to re-examine and re-examine and re-examine the story you're trying to tell because everything's so much more difficult. And, um, and I feel, you know, I wouldn't ever say, oh, you know, it's the best thing that ever happened. I'm not that much of a Pollyanna, but I will say that I think we made an extraordinary series up against that, you know, those challenges. And, um, you know, that Halston is a book that I optioned with Dan Minahan 25 years ago. Um, and we had just worked together on a very early movie of mine. I shot Andy Warhol. And then I produced his first film, which was called Series 7. And then he went on to become like a television director, etc. But we have have literally been trying to figure out how to make Halston for 25 years. Um, and sometimes people will say to me, yeah, I heard it was in development a really long time, like 10 or 15 years. And I'm like, should I correct them? Like, does that make me look really like terrible that it took so long? But I correct them because it's part of the story of the movie, of, of, the, of the series. The other show, Pride, is interesting because it's a doc series and that's not really what we're known for. Although, you know, we, we, we've come on to a fair number of docs, but usually when they are fairly far along, for example, Dina, uh, the doc that won Sundance a few years ago, we came on um, when they needed help, you know, shaping the story. Um, and we also have done, as Eugene knows, because he's seen it, Todd Haynes' Velvet Underground documentary, which we did do from the ground up. Um, but the Pride series was interesting because we were originally approached 
and asked if this was something we would want to co-produce with what was then Refinery29 that became Vice. And, um, and I thought, you know, I, I love watching those like very clip heavy archival talking head docs, but why would you get me to make something like that? Like, that's just not like, it's not something I'd be particularly good at. And if we're gonna do something like this, like, you know, this history, this notion of history, we have to do it in a way that feels true to killer and true to what we can bring to the table. So I, I made the, you know, I, I said what, the way I wanted to do it was we wanted to have a different director for each episode. There were six episodes, seven directors finally, because two directors directed one episode. And, um, and that's a particularly, particularly challenging thing to do. It kind of means instead of like having your smooth series, you know, of your six episodes, it's like each episode is a startup. Each episode is like its own mini film. And some of the directors had done documentaries before. Some of them had never done docs before. Some of them had never done television before. So uh, it, was, it was extraordinarily challenging. FX let us do it. I think sometimes they were like, like, why did we do this? But I think the results are something that feel really original and not like something you've seen before. You, you, you're elaborating on pride. So I'm gonna start by asking a few questions there, but we're gonna come back to Halston in a minute. Of course. Folks, I know, I know if um, my own friend group is any indication, a lot of people are watching it and talking about it right now. So we'll get back to Halston in a minute, but we're on pride, it's pride. This conversation is, is framed by pride. So, um, you talked about the creative decisions you made. You talked about uh, making something that was true to killer. So I wanna ask you what that means for you today. If you don't have, help our audience understand what that means sure. to make something that's true to killer films. Um, and then as you were deciding, um, you know, Pride is such a big topic and you're working with all these different directors, help us understand the, the thought process about how you sort of chop this big notion of pride up into more digestible ideas that can be tackled by individual directors, the, the conversation you had with those filmmakers or what you brought to the table to sort of help uh, frame how we would see, how it would be, um, how it would be dissected, how it'd be presented. Well, w what we really decided to do was allow each filmmaker their own take on their particular decade. And, um, and, and, you know, FX was very much behind us in this, like, it has to be character driven. That's, you know, that's what it's really about. But for example, the first episode, the 50s, which is directed by Tom Kalin, he uses reenactments, you know, dramatic reenactments. They never are used again in the series. So if you're settling into this and thinking, oh, it's going to be this kind of a show, that's like, no, it isn't. It's going to be, and then, you know, Cheryl Dunye, for example, who did the 70s, has a, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, her films, she often puts herself in her films, and she put herself in her episode. And again, no one else did that. So each episode feels at once part of a whole. There are characters that recur, and but at the same time, they also feel extremely personal to the filmmaker who, who made them. You know, one of my great pleasures was the last filmmaker who came on board was Andrew Ahn. And, you know, he's a narrative filmmaker. Um, and uh, he was like, oh, okay, this sounds kind of interesting. So which, what, what de decades are you doing? And I was like, you're getting the 60s because that's all that's left. <laughs> and, um, and he was like, okay, okay, uh, uh, okay. And, you know, of course he wasn't born in the 60s. But one of the great things about the show too, I think, is that there's that sense of discovery that comes from people finding things out that they didn't know about themselves and bringing it to the audience is really, is really pretty spectacular. From a, from a, the, thank you for that clarity. I mean, I think I'm, I'm curious how you all in the earlier stages before you're deciding which directors you're gonna invite to be part of this process, to what extent you thought about how pride as a concept needed to be, wanted to be uh, recontextualized, kind of uh, uh, enriched. Maybe that's a better word for it. I mean, what I, you know, again, what I sort of love about it is 
I, I, I will follow social media and people will say, well, you know, it pisses me off that there were no, you know, fill in the blank here. And I'm like, wait till the next episode. And it's like, you know, there should have been more stories about, and I'm like, wait till the next episode. You know, I mean, I can't say you can't ever cover everything and who knows, but I feel like organically by being very inclusive, by inviting directors of, of, you know, uh, from really different places, from narrative film, from documentary film, um, uh, from, you know, young, older, et cetera. I feel like we really dug into this sprawling sense of a history that you can't really make linear, but at least you can get under its hood in a way that I don't think anyone's done quite the same way before. It's interesting because as someone who was born in the 60s, I think about pride differently. You know, in the two 2020s than I did in the 80s or in the 90s. Um, what do you what do you make um, of of sort of how you think about pride as, as something that now you know folks are talking you know uh, intensely about being co opted, being commercialized? Pride is a whole different thing in 2021 than it was in the 80s and 90s, and certainly than it was in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I mean, when you say pride, you're talking about the actual event that's going to happen. The actual. <laughs> the, the actual right i mean look you know i was probably doing what you were doing in the 90s late 80s and 90s which was marching felt like a act of of um revolution uh you know um i mean i can't emphasize enough and this is you know this is something that goes hand in hand often with you know like the how did you get started as a producer question, which is I often have to remind people, uh, and why did you want to, you know, why were your early films, you know, so, um, you know, uh, so queer oriented? Because we were in the middle of the AIDS crisis and it felt there's this extraordinary sense of, of urgency that if we didn't tell our stories now, they were never going to get told. And now, you know, we're, we're in another pandemic. But the difference with that pandemic uh, you know, the, the, uh, the AIDS crisis, whatever you want to call it, is we felt extraordinarily disenfranchised. It truly felt like the world didn't care if we lived or died. And um, uh, we decided to start our careers, make work, you know, try and tell our stories in, in you know, in light of all that. And pride at that time, as I said, felt like you know, I'm just going to go out there and just show the world I'm here, you know, and, and that I exist. So now, you know, with the corporate floats and all of that, it is different. Uh, but um, and there's a lot. And I think, you know, our last Pride episode kind of gets into that in a way that I think is incisive and, and strong. But it's, um, you know, it's a different time. Um, so I told you I would also ask you, uh, you, you made a comment earlier about wanting to make something that was true to what Killer Films is right. today. So help us understand how, you, how you, you lead your company to make those kinds of decisions. How do you define what is true to Killer Films today? It's certainly rooted in the history of Killer Films, and we can get into that as we talk about more of your films. But, but how do you sort of simplify for us the definition of what is true to Killer Films today? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, cause you know, the easy answer is, well, I know it when I see it, but I think, you know, the longer answer is simply, I still want to be challenged. I don't want to just put my name on something and, and, you know, collect a fee. Although sometimes I'm a little like, why not? That'd be great. Uh, but I, you know, I, I why like not? <laughs> why don't you want to? Because, because I'd rather do the work. I'd rather do the work and, and find something that feels new. And um, look, I, I'm not saying Pride reinvented documentary at all, you know, I because I, it didn't. But I am saying that there was a sort of like, uh, you know, intersection of of a of a network that that you know <clears throat> was allowing us to do something perhaps a little bit more experimental us who had access to filmmakers that may not do something like this unless they knew that there was a company like ours there that would protect them. And then the filmmakers themselves that really were allowed to uh, 
you know, to, to, to dig deeper than they might have been in another situation. So all of those things together were an interesting, provocative, sometimes messy, but ultimately extraordinarily satisfying situation, if that makes sense. So when mm -hmm. we're looking for work now, you know, it's really, um, it's re you know, it, it's the same thing. It's, does it feel original? Does it feel, um, you know, like a, like a, like, does it feel zeitgeisty? What makes us, I mean, way back when, when I wrote Shooting to Kill, the question we asked ourselves was, um, is this a movie? Then we started asking ourselves, like maybe, you know, 10, 10 years later, maybe even less, is it a theatrical movie? Because suddenly there was a difference, you know? And then if it is a theatrical movie, what makes it theatrical? And then that became a whole question. What is a thea theatrical, non-theatrical? Well, now the question is like, you know, like we so sliced and diced this question, we get a great piece of material. And then the, you know, we get into the whole like, is it a streamer? Which streamer, if it is, uh, is it something that people, you know, this whole idea of like, what is theatrical going to look like? But then the other question is, what do we all want to see now? You know, and that is a wildly divisive, you know, discussion from, you know, and I talk to networks and streamers and theatrical distributors, and they all say everything, you know, everything from, you know, basically, People are only going to want to see things that make them laugh. They've been miserable for a year and a half. So they don't want to see your like, you know, character driven dramas. And the other side from companies that you wouldn't expect it from say, no, people need to have a catharsis. Like we've been through something and we need to go through something with characters to be able to get back, get in, maybe not the exact thing, but things that feel like that have parallels so that we can get through what we just what just happened to us. So I don't know. One of the things um, that Christine has been saying to me for a long time, and I'm going to frame it into a question for you, Christine. But I'm saying directing this at our audience. One of the things Christine has said to me over numerous conversations over decades now. It's crazy that it's been that long. Is that uh, the next movie is just as hard as the last one? It's just as much of an uphill battle and climb and struggle and, you know, so there's that side of it, which is being an independent producer, it's still a struggle no matter. We're gonna talk about Halston in a second, 25 years working to put that together. On the other hand, you have to at least acknowledge that given your career, where you're at, having your name and Killer Films name behind a filmmaker, especially if it's a first time director, whether it's for film or series, um, or a property that you that you that you I that you want to um, acquire the rights for and try to make a movie or series about it that has cachet that has that that brings uh, that's an element that brings potential to a project that didn't exist were you or your company or, or your taste not involved so how do you sort of marry that to this kind of mission and focus that you just talked about with with, with Killer, that, that struggle that it still is always going to be for you to work independently, but knowing that you can, you can bring a lot of momentum to something just by saying, I'm interested. We can, that's true. But I think it's like, and, and this is pre-pandemic as well, we have been right. dealing with a constantly changing marketplace. So, and, and we have to, I mean, and this, you know, just the, to go back to Halston for a second, one of the things that attracted me, I am making a point, Eugene, I'm not, I'm not, not answering the question, I promise. Um, one of the things that so attracted me about the story of Halston's story was that collision of art and commerce. And because I see that in my own, you know, in my daily life, in my career and, um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, trying, to fig trying to navigate that path to production and figure out like, okay, this is a first time director, which has become insanely impossible. It really has. And uh, 
but we're still we're still dedicated to you know not doing only first time directors of course because that would then we wouldn't eat but trying to find the ones that we can really get behind and find that path to production not just because it's something we you know want to do but because those movies also they keep me uncynical they keep me like focused on the fact that like these are people who are often telling a story they've waited their whole life to tell and they get to that set and what they bring is something that I sort of feel like I need to see again and again because it, it is it's a you know it's a tough business to not get cynical in you know I mean, there's a, there's a lot of rewards for bad behavior, you know, and, uh, um, and, and, and it, can, it can be tough. So I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sort of trying to- hey, we're, building on, we're building on topics, so I'm, it's all good. I think it, it, it lays a foundation for what, uh, something I wanna ask you as a follow-up, which is when you talk about cynicism, I felt like, and I, I, don't, I wish I was trying to find the exact citation of, of a conversation you and I had um, within the past decade, but it was a time when you were more outspoken about exploring and considering and moving into producing series or television. And I felt like there was an industry cynicism because you addressed it in, in a conversation we had uh, uh, at a panel or something um, because you were, you were, you were, you were starting to explore producing for producing other, you know, something other than a feature 90 minute feature film, two hour feature film. And, and you acknowledged that there was a little bit of cynicism within the industry about that, um, that you were sort of forging ahead despite the fear and trepidation and concern and anxiety that maybe more traditional filmmakers and producers were, were sort of putting out in the world that right. we needed to kind of hunker down and stick to feature films. Right. Um, so you, so, uh, but now look, look where we are, right? right. Um, uh, how looking back at this, uh, just as a decade of, of that, you know, kind of being in that, in, in a world that's not just about feature films. And, and as, we, as we hone in on, on Halston now, um, 25 years with a property like Halston, you could have held on and you, you, it, it must've started as a feature film, right? So you could have held on and, and decided to keep it in that vein, but you decided to go in a different direction, why? Well, you know, uh, first of all, we could, we, for whatever reason, we couldn't we couldn't crack it as a feature film, and um, and at the time story wise, you mean story wise? Story wise, uh, okay. At the time, twenty five years ago, the idea of a miniseries wasn't really like available to me. I didn't really, you know, a miniseries was. Oh, I'm really dating myself. Was Roots, you know, and that was, you know, or QB Seven, like that was it. And it didn't occur to me that Halston could live in that space. Um, and we, kept, we couldn't quite, there was so much of that story we wanted to tell. Um, we didn't want it to, we didn't want it to feel like a typical rise and fall. As the years went by and we started digging deeper into what was the story, you know, Dan became a more experienced storyteller. He, he became a, you know, uh, he went from being, you know, a guy with one credit, you know, who had just directed his first feature film to being, you know, one of the, you know, uh, one of the top television directors in the world. So his notion of storytelling and craft shifted and changed. I went on, you know, from having produced like five movies when Dan and I met to over a hundred. So, so our conversation was able to shift. And at a certain point, you know, a few years ago, we had a conversation like, if this is ever gonna happen, like we kind of both have to clear the decks and figure it out. And that's when we were like, it's a mini series. And then, you know, luckily Dan had been working with Ryan Murphy who saw in Halston, I think a lot of what I saw in it, a lot of its potential, you know, and, uh, uh, and again, I will always say the thing to me that I kept going back to because, you know, fashion isn't exactly my, <laughs> you know, my, uh, uh, my reason to live, but this notion of how an artist lives in the world and that collision of art and commerce is very much on my mind. And I imagine it's on Ryan's as well. 
you may say that fashion is not uh, a world that you feel like you live in. On, on the other hand, um, wearing those boots that you wear on the red carpet in Cannes certainly became a, a, an iconic fashion moment for that festival a couple of years ago. That's true, but I remember telling my then like 18 year old daughter that, um, uh, that my boots had gone viral and she was like, no, they didn't. <laughs> she was like, if they had, I'd know about it and I don't. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Good try, nice yeah. try. <laughs> um, what is, what, well, what, what in your role today, in the work you do today, Christine, what is what is gratifying about that work today, and what is still, or if not still, what is challenging? What what is what what can be daunting about the work that you do? Gratifying and, and daunting. I mean, it's always gratifying just to like get to you know every day. I feel like what I try to do is move every single thing that we're working on one step forward. And, you know, sometimes that's very mundane, like getting the director to agree to have a meeting with somebody who you really know is right for it. Uh, you know, um, getting an actor, an actor from overseas, a visa, um, you know, uh, uh, moving forward on location selection of something, you know, getting a deal point done, getting a pitch over the, you know, over the hump all of those things, when they happen, it's like, you know, those are like those fist bump moments of just like, okay, you know, um, uh, like we, we managed to convey to this, you know, distributor or, or to this, you know, potential financier, what we were trying to do. And it feels like they responded. I guess what's, you know, difficult is just, you know, the, the usual drudgery of like, there's, you know, the budgets, the schedules, the overambition that almost all of our films, you know, suffer from of, uh, you know, you know, the, the director wants this and you, your budget is that. So how do you reconcile that? And, um, and when you find the solutions, those are great moments, but there's a lot of drudgery to get to the solutions and difficulty and passion and ego and, and disappointment. Mm. Mm. Are there other um, Halston type properties out there that you just haven't been able to crack? Like the, or is that one of the record holders? What are the record holders for like having something well, and just try? Yeah. Are there others that are out there like that too? Uh, you know, I don't know because it's like, there's that, you know, that sort of lazy Susan of the zeitgeist, you know, that just kind of like, like, and you, you, you put something on it and then you might have to wait for 10 years for it to come back around to you. And um, I almost can't identify, if you had asked me pre-Halston what that was, I probably would have said Halston. Because yeah, really? just like the one. It was just like, I just, I know it's a good idea. And what's great now is it really does feel like a lot of people are watching it, you know? And, and you know, some people aren't liking it. And some people are loving it and all of that, but it feels like it's very much in the conversation. You know, I, I you know, I saw my, you know, my doctor last week who's probably in her seventies and it was, you know, it was all she could talk about. And I was a little like, aren't we going to look at me? <laughs> and she was like, oh, and then the, you know, people, <laughs> uh, you know, people from really crazy walks of life in my life are reaching out to me to tell me they've seen it. So that's awesome, you know? Um, but I don't know if I have another one that's really weighed on me so heavily. Mm. Uh, 30 years since Poison, how is that possible? Um, you tell me, because we both look so young. You look young. <laughs> <laughs> um, 30 years since Poison, so 30 years ago, Poison uh, signaled it signaled a lot to independent film, I would say, um, not just in the subject matter of the film. If anybody here watching this conversation or listening to it has not seen the film, um, 30 years is not too late to go back and watch it. Uh, but it, 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 it introduced, not introduced, but it, it, it signaled um, so much about not just Todd, uh, but about you and your collaboration with Todd. 
uh, the two of you have uh, a film you mentioned that I've been fortunate to see that's, that's tr truly beautiful, a documentary about the Velvet Underground that will be out um, later this year, right? Um, what do you think it is? I know you've been asked this question, but for those who are, might be watching and who are, who are, as Sumaya said earlier, are looking for those alliances or trying to bolster those alliances that will propel hopefully their careers, um, what is it about that, that bond that 30 years later, you're still making movies together with this guy named Todd Haynes. You guys clearly bonded early. You bonded before Poison, but, um, but, but what was it? What is it, what is it that has kept that creative connection? But so we, really, we really bonded on Poison. I mean, I think that when we started Poison, I, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. And there were, uh, you know, I, I had worked in film production. I hadn't really been a producer or not on anything of that scale. But I'd worked on enough film productions to have a sense of, of how you do it, right? But I also learned, and I learned this from Todd, that saying, well, this is how it's done is, is a kind of a creative kiss of death. And we were, you know, I was like, okay, I'm producing my first movie. And, and, um, and look, and I came to Poison absolutely the right way in the sense that I knew Todd, I saw his film, Karen Carpenter, Superstar, The Karen Carpenter Story, which I w helped him with a little bit, but I didn't produce it. And it's an extraordinary short film. And if you haven't see seen it, everybody who's participating in this conversation, you should immediately, when this is over, Google it because it is posted on the web illegally constantly. Um, it's like whack-a-mole, it goes up, they take it down, it goes up again. So um, I, I saw that film and I had a little epiphany of like, this is the, this, is exactly the kind of filmmaking I want to be involved in. So my next question to Todd was, what do you want to do next? And can I produce it? Can I be part of it? So when I started producing Poison, I had an idea of like what I, the role I was supposed to play, what I was supposed to do, gleaned from seeing other producers on set, et cetera. And I can't even remember exactly what it was, but there was something Todd wanted to do that was you know, unorthodox, that was complicated, that didn't really make sense from a production point of view. And I was like, no, can't do it that way. Um, and he said, why? And I said, because it's just not how you do it. And he was, was like, well, why can't it be the way we do it? And it was a little bit of like a wake up call, like, yeah, you know? It's not that complicated to figure it out the way he wants to do it. And, um, and maybe it'll be a better result for the film. So it's just, uh, you know, that was, that was sort of the beginning. And I think, you know, Todd and I have had our ups and downs on everything we've done together, but that sort of started to form a kind of trust between us. Todd is insanely loyal and I'm insanely loyal. It's just like, you know, I've been with the same life partner for 30 years and I've been with the same business partner for 30 years. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's like we, and if you have that fierce loyalty, it means you can fight and disagree because you know that like, they're not going, you know, you're not going anywhere. So it's kind of this relief and, um, and now, you know, Todd and I have a shorthand. Um, I really, you know, I, I really understand, you know, I can sit in a meeting and be like, he's not gonna like that. Oh, he'll be all right with that, you know. Um, but, uh, but I also, and this is the last thing I'll say about it. I also still have the privilege of every movie of his I see, which I see again and again and again, cause I have to. I always see something new in them that I didn't see the last time I saw them. Like sometimes I will show Carol or Velvet Goldmine or I'm Not There or, or Dark Waters to, to a class. And they'll, you know, and I'll be like, you know, I'm just going to watch like a half hour of it. And often I only will, you know, because as Eugene says, I do like my wine and that's usually when I get to have it. But, um, uh, but sometimes I'll just be like, wow, 
I knew what he was building here, but I didn't notice that detail. And what a pleasure it is to get to see that now. And I just, you know, I feel it's such a privilege to work with a filmmaker like that. Before we take, thank you. Before we take questions from uh, folks who uh, who are watching, um, your 30th anniversary collaboration, or it'll be out in the world 30 years after Poison, is as I mentioned, Velvet Underground. Uh, don't say too much because people haven't seen it yet, but um, but it is coming soon to a to a big festival in another part of the world. Congratulations! Well, that on Velvet was Gun announced, Eugene. Just announced. It was just yeah. announced. Yes. I'm talking about the Cannes Film Festival. Yes. Um, uh, just give folks a little, you know, two minute teaser on what, what the movie is so they can uh, look forward to it. You know, The Velvet Underground, uh, for those of you who don't know, was one of the was a seminal band in the 60s that the tagline is, I think, you know, only 20,000 people ever bought their records. But every single person who bought their record started a band. <laughs> so they were one of those, you know, insanely influential bands that like nobody ever listened to, except for those 20,000 people. And, but it's also a story, it's a story about this band that, you know, Andy Warhol really had a big hand in putting together, but it's also about, you know, art at a certain time in America and, uh, and what that, what, what, what the whole notion of the underground meant uh, what, you know, what alternative meant, um, all of those things kind of mixed together in a kind of beautiful Todd Haynesian, you know, soup that feels like it's not just about the Velvet Underground, it's an actual Velvet Underground experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was his first documentary. We, we worked with, uh, you know, the folks at Motto who, you know, knew how to make documentaries, which neither of us did. Um, and uh, I, I'm really, I, I'm really thrilled at how it turned out. Congratulations. Uh, okay, so let's take some questions. I see there are uh, a few of them here and I'm just going to dive in. I'm reading them for the first time. I'll just take them in order and we'll get to as many as we can, Christine. Um, question number one, in your opinion, What's the future for independent feature films? Uh, and how do you see things being reimagined perhaps? I mean, look, that's the gazillion dollar question. Uh, you know, my short answer is I have no idea. The longer <laughs> answer is, um, you know, I had, I, I have always been very much a like, you don't put the genie back in the bottle kind of person, you know, it's like, like great, you know, these disruptions happen, whether it's our move from uh, uh, film to digital, uh, what that did to the whole like editing process, um, the, you know, getting rid of DVDs, streamers, all of those things. I'm just like, move on, move on, move on. But I went to the Venice Film Festival last September as, as a jury member. And it was a crazy experience. It was in the middle of COVID. I honestly didn't think I'd get to go until I was walking onto the airplane. And I was like, they're letting me go. And, um, and I watched 20 movies in 10 days or two weeks after not having seen a movie in a theater uh, you know, for, for more than six months. And it reinvigorated not only my my, you know, sent, you know, somewhat whatever sentimental love for that, for cinematic, you know, for watching movies in a theater, but for my more pragmatic place, I was like, this isn't going away. Like people are still gonna wanna, this is a separate kind of art form uh, cause, cause it casts a spell. It does something that cannot happen when you're watching something on your laptop or even your big screen TV that you can pause and do whatever, it casts a different kind of spell. And this is gonna last. So what that looks like, what that feels like, I don't know. And what is gonna say to somebody like me, like that is that, but that other thing isn't, I don't know yet, so. Right, thank you. Okay, next question coming in, uh, let's see, from M.A. Cherry. Uh, regarding pride, uh, besides yourself and the production team, was there a cohesion in the writing of the whole piece? Great work. 
Yeah, you know, we had an extraordinary showrunner, executive producer, Alex Stapleton, who really had to do the heavy lifting. And she, uh, she really helped give it that cohesion while at the same time, you know, trying to honor each, indiv each individual director's individual kind of storytelling. So um, I would say if you felt like there was, it's really due to her. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got nine minutes and more than nine questions. So I'm gonna get to as many as I can and we'll try to uh, we'll do like a power round here. Uh, Kuya Youngblood, thank you for the great conversation. Two questions. Uh, one, any advice for female and BIPOC producers and TV execs who are trying to make their way? And two, how do you know a pitch has legs and it's worth the fight? Um, you know, my advice to female and BIPOC producers and TV execs is just, it's changing, it's changing slowly. I feel like, um, I feel like right now there is a moment of um, a lot of interest in, in at least, at least an effort on the part of a lot of places that have, places that have been traditionally, you know, straight, white, and male to try and, re and to try to reach out to those stories. So don't ever be intimidated and don't ever assume that your story is not something that, you know, that network, that streamer, that studio doesn't want to hear because this is the moment where, where, you know, there's, there is uh, some, I mean, some, uh, uh, some fluidity. Um, and how do I know if a pitch has legs and is worth the fight? I mean, that's just, you know, if I like it, I'm certainly not always right. And I have certainly made, you know, I've, I've gone out, we had a pitch that we took out in the middle of the pandemic that felt exactly right. It was a comedy. It was you know, diverse in a way that I don't think people had ever seen before, but maybe it was just still a little too radical or not, you know, and I was just like, are, are people crazy? But then I'm putting that on my zeitgeist lazy Susan and letting mm. that like come back around. Cause I know it's good. And I know that at some point people will want to see it. In fact, but it's not, you know, network execs don't decide what people want to see. They decide what they're going to let them see. And that's what you have to remember. To remember. Um, Samantha Sherman has a question that kind of builds on that. For a first timer who's developing a TV series, um, do you recommend pitching to a production company before setting up meetings with networks just to have more power on the team? I know there's not one path, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this new journey for a first timer who's trying to develop. You know, I, I really still feel, even though we've made a number of TV or streaming series, I still feel like a novice myself. And I also feel like it's a, it, it's an area where things change a lot. You know, um, I mean, the thing about when you're developing a movie, you go in and people give you soft passes, which is like the worst thing in the world. It's like, you know, you come out and they're, and they're like, well, they didn't say no. So we're gonna keep working on it. But with, with television and the streamers, I feel like you go in and people really say to you, no one, we don't think anyone wants to see this right now. So you're, you're, you then decide, okay, well, I, I guess I just have to put this away because you know, no one, I, I've just been told no one wants to see this. So in a way I appreciate that. I like that that's what happens in that world. So this is a long winded way of saying a production company can be very helpful because they will understand that world. Uh, in, you know, and sometimes I find with a production company, they'll say, your pitch is good, but it should be a little bit more like that because that's what this company's really looking for. That said, a lot of the streamers now, they don't wanna work with a production company. They will honestly, their first question to you, if you, you know, if you are, uh, if they, if you're lucky enough to, you know, that, that they want to actually make your project, their first question to you might be, can you get rid of the production company? You know, <laughs> so it's a, it's a crapshoot. Um, 
and again, it's a long-winded way of saying, I don't know, and I hope that helps. <laughs> well, and there's a sort of parallel question, but coming from a, a European perspective, uh, Romas Zabrowskis, uh, who is a queer filmmaker in Lithuania, watching at half past midnight right now, um, is sort of asking a similar question, but from the European perspective, any context you can offer, I'm inspired by American cinema and would love to work with an American producer in the future or to convince streamers to produce films in our own region, not just shoot it here in Lithuania. Um, I have ideas and scripts, but how can I even try this as a European writer director? How do I seek representation? Save money, go to the AFM, find contacts on IMDb Pro, and email people. What do you think? Any quick thoughts? You know, I guess, as I always say, and this is like, I hope this is a generous enough answer. Um, and it's tough right now because we aren't going to film festivals. We aren't, you know, we're, we're doing this. And one of the things I, that was enormously helpful for me on a, on a you know, on, in a slightly different universe, but not that different. And Eugene, you can add to this is, you know, get yourself in the world. I mean, when I was a, you know, a young film producer, most of the people that were young with me, you know, people like James Seamus and Ted Hope and Marcus Hu, uh, they went on to, you know, be distributors and studio heads, etc. But at one point, we were all like sharing hotel rooms at, in Berlin and Cannes. And when you get yourself in that world, and you really start you know, trying to figure out like, okay, there's no point in me trying to meet me, the head of Killer Films, but there's people that work with me who are much younger than me and whose job is to meet you. So those are the people to focus on, your cohort, the people that will, you know, in, in you know, years from now be the people running the business and the people that, you know, I, cause I remember those relationships I made are really the, still the primary relationships in my life. So mm. I, I don't really know a, you know, should you go to the AFM? I went to the AFM with Poison uh, to, to sell it to uh, a, Jap a Japanese distributor. And I had no clue what I was doing and um, sort of figured it out but I had a mission and a purpose and Todd's mother drove me around cause I don't know how to drive. So she, you know, so she drove me, you know, to Lowe's and waited outside for me, you know, cause Todd wasn't, he was like at some other film festival. Well, I went in and tried to pretend like I knew how to sell a movie, you know? Um, so, you know, those are the, the I, 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 I don't really know any other way. Um, let's try to get to just a couple more. We're almost out of time. Uh, Jennifer Klein asks, Christine, what did you mean when you said that most of killer films, killer's films are over ambitious? I mean that we gravitate towards movies where, you know, where filmmakers have very big visions and very ambitious visions. And often the budget doesn't match the vision. And we have to figure out a way you know, to make it to make it work, we you know our movies are fiscally responsible. They tend to be on budget. That's why we get to keep making them. But we have to figure out that like extremely narrow path of how you get something, how you get something made and done that feels you know feels like its eyes are way bigger than its stomach, you know. Um, and that's what kind of what we're known for. Okay, we're gonna do one more. Jacqueline Powell, you get the last question. Um, I think it's a good place to end. Is it your influence on the film that shaped Halston, Carol, Shirley, and more? I think I'd be able to know a quote unquote Christine Vachon film by the style of the film. What do you think of that? I, I don't think it's, I don't know that it's my influence at all. I, you know, I always say, you know, I'm not the artist, I'm the artist enabler. I think it's more <laughs> like it's, I, you know, Halston, I've already talked about, like what attracted me to that, to, to that material. Um, Carol and Shirley are both a very kind of, very extremely different, but very specific star driven, to a certain extent, uh, character driven films about, you know, women kind of trapped by the times they were in. 
So I was attracted to both those stories. You know, uh, I mean, there were wildly different experiences, obviously, because Carol was Todd and Shirley was Josephine Decker, um, you know, who was at a different place in her career, but watching Josephine you know, make make Shirley and and you know crack that open was was a joy, um, and watching Todd on Carol was a different kind of joy because it was sort of it was kind of like he was at the top of his career, uh, and um, anyway, so yes, there's a similarity in that both felt you know both those movies brought me there with the, the those kinds of characters but um, I, I'm not sure where else it goes. Mm. Um, so I wanna say uh, thank you to Christine. Thank you to uh, In Creative Company. Thank you to Bushwick Film Festival. Uh, please, if you can, not only seek out Poison on its 30th anniversary this year, uh, but check out Halston, uh, check out Pride on FX right now. Um, Zola's coming up. We didn't even get into Zola. Oh, uh, okay. so let me say Zola is opening please. theatrically June 30th. And so, I mean, you know, the kind of the reason I don't talk too much about Zola now is because I just want you all to see it. And it's, it's just so damn amazing. It is. Check out Zola coming soon, um, June, June 30th, you said. And, uh, and later this year, The Velvet Underground. That's right. Uh, anything, anything else you want to plug before we uh, say goodbye? I guess that's it. We'll stop there. Christine, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for joining us from Pennsylvania and your hotel room there. Um, and congratulations on everything. Good luck with everything. Thank you, guys. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>